Welcome to the new world of work. I'm Adi Ignatius, Editor-in-Chief of Harvard Business Review. And each week on this show, we try to explore various aspects of the future of work. We live in pretty remarkable times right now. Um, we are all trying to survive a pandemic, trying to get back to normal in our workplaces. Uh, we're coping with the war in Ukraine. So, you know, we hope that this show provides a respite and maybe some inspiration for all of you as you're coping with your uh, own work challenges. So before I introduce our guest this week, um, let me read a, a word from our friends at Unisys. Unisys is an IT company that builds critical solutions trusted by demanding businesses and governments around the world. They partner with clients to enable cloud transformation, protect critical operations, and empower the modern workforce. Visit unisys.com to learn more. So our guest this week is Jared Spataro. So Jared is, uh, he heads the team at Microsoft that is really looking at the future of work and also trying to figure out how to develop, uh, develop deliver the technologies that will get us there. So I think we'll, uh, you know, we want to learn what he's seen through his research. They just finished a, a big study that he'll talk about and to really get a sense of how Microsoft is looking at how we will innovate and collaborate together in the future. So Jared, welcome. Thank you, Adi. Great to be here with you. Uh, well, it's really great to have you. And, and let's just start. You know, I know you've you've just finished a survey, um, uh, you know, related to all the topics that that we're interested in, that our audience is interested in. So maybe you can you can talk about you know one or two findings um, from that 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 you think are important. You bet. Yeah, the the survey is called the the 2022 Work Trend Index. It's our second annual publishing of that survey. We're very excited about it. In breadth and depth, it, we think it offers a pretty good view of what's happening, 31,000 people across 31 countries. And if I just take a step back for a moment and give you a, a headliner, I would simply say that there are some amazing expectations that employees have as they're headed back to the workplace in a more hybrid type of way. And that really kind of is how we think about what the findings say in aggregate. And maybe one other thing I'll add is it just feels like the people who left the office are so different from the people who are coming back now we've changed in some really fundamental ways and that's gonna have a big Im impact on the future of work. All right, so if you're watching this, if you have questions for Jared, uh, put them into the comments. We'll try to get to um, some viewer questions later, but um, all right, so you got me interested, Jared. So when you said people you know, are coming back to the office, they are different in, in fundamental ways than they were when they left. Talk about that, what does that mean? Well, I'd start with this. If we had gone back home to work for two months, three months, maybe even six months, it would have been a blip. It would have been something that we managed through. We wouldn't have thought much about it. You know, two years later, we have all adapted in, you know, really significant ways. We've adapted our lives. We've learned how to use this flexibility. Last year, the survey showed us that over 70 percent, it was 73 percent of people said, hey, post pandemic, when we head back to an office, I hope that the flexibility that we have will stay. And that has persisted. We see that throughout the results this year again. But listen to this. Leaders in companies say, in fact, over 50% of leaders in this survey said, but guess what? We want you back in the office full time. We want you back here so that we can be five days a week together. And we think that those expectations you know, of the employee and the employers are really going to clash here in the coming months, really over the coming years uh, as we try and figure all of this out. So there's some major expectation changes, I think, in employees and what they think an employer should offer. But many leaders don't fully understand how their employees have changed. Well, but let me push a little bit at the, at the idea of change because, you know, any survey is a snapshot in time. This is what people are feeling right now. You know, when we surveyed people when the pandemic first broke out, you know, people were heartbroken that their, 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 their work life relationships had been broken up. You know, now people are at a different place. They, you know, in some cases can't imagine going back to the office. Wouldn't you expect that would change, that would continue to evolve and that gulf between what employers are feeling and what workers are feeling will continue to narrow? You know, that's the most common question I get asked by business leaders when I present some of these findings. They say, isn't this a pendulum, Jared? Aren't we going to swing back to the middle? And in many ways, I'd say yes. But, but what I would highlight is that we've swung to the far side with remote. We won't stay remote. We're definitely going back to this place where people are going to gather together. That's going to be an important part of business. But flexibility is something that is here to stay from our perspective. Just a couple of data points that really caught my attention. Over half of the people we surveyed, 53% said that they were more likely to prioritize their health and well-being over work now after two years. 47% of people said that they were more likely to put family and personal life over work. 
And what we really have seen happen here over the course of this last two years has really been a fundamental shift, I think, of, of how people perceive work as fitting into their lives. And we talk about that as the worth it equation, what they're willing to give up in, in, uh, for a, an employer or for employment. And that has really changed, we think, over the last two years. So yes, will there be some kind of swinging back for sure? But I think that the labor market has changed in fundamental ways because people's psyche has changed, their values have changed. So does your data suggest what that worth it calculation is? You know, whether it's in terms of, of number of days in the office or length of commute or what happens in the office, you know, any, any, any data on that? We have a little bit. We did ask people, well, you know, if you had to tell us what's important to you from your job, what would it be? Unsurprisingly, pay tops the list. You know, people think of work very much as an economic transaction, and we think that that's the right way to think of it. But right below pay were the following. Positive culture was the second. Uh, well-being benefits was number two. A sense of purpose and, well and meaning was number three. Flexi flexible hours, number four. And then vacation time, number five. So, Boy, that gives you some sense, you know, we might not be able to, to have the mathematical calculation for the whole labor market, but it does give you a sense of what 31,000 people are saying was really important to them from their job. And I think that's very different than what we were seeing prior to the pandemic. So I'll ask you the question that I pretty much ask every week to every guest, and that is, you know, what is the point of an office? Um, you know, if, if employers want people physically back they're thinking okay now maybe's the time and maybe not just two days a week maybe more than that what is the point of the office and and you know how, how do we how do we how do we ensure that people are coming to the, to the office for some productive reason rather than it's where i go to work yeah i would i would start with that kind of underlying assumption before the pandemic i think the point of the office was it was the place to essentially punch the clock. You were showing, hey, I'm, I'm working now, boss, see what I'm doing. Um, and in fact, we see many people in their survey telling us, you know what, I, I don't even know why or when I go into the office anymore. I'm not quite sure I understand. In our research, the thing that we've uncovered is that it's really about social capital. In other words, moving an organization forward isn't just about projects and transactional completion of tasks. It really is about the way that people are bound together yeah, so that they honestly create a greater whole. They can compound their efforts. They can be more innovative. And that's all based on social capital. What the research has found is when we're apart, we draw down social capital. There's just no two ways about it. But when we're together in person, the interactions are so rich. The cues and clues we pick up from those types of conversations, discussions, and work together are so rich that they fill our social capital bank accounts back up. And so we really believe as we look at the, the go forward pattern for work, that the office is going to be a place where you create social capital, where you build it up and you'll draw it down at other times and you'll build it back up. So this continual kind of uh, shepherding of social capital, we think, is going to have to be something that leaders have on their minds can, going forward just to make sure that the organization really runs well. And are you suggesting then that you build up that social capital, not merely by physically being in the office? but by being more purposeful about we're having people come to the office, whatever it is, twice a week, once a month to do certain types of tasks. I mean, what to talk a little bit more about, you know, how do you build that social capital? Yeah, that's right. Um, well, what we're finding is, you know, almost, almost 40% of the people we surveyed said that they, they just are confused about why they come into the office or in particular when they come into the office. And so as we've gone out and done the qual follow-ups, so the qualitative follow-ups and asked the employers and asked the employees and then combine that with some of the research from Microsoft Research, we would say, hey, you have to be really deliberate about bringing people together to solve problems, bringing people together to have what I would call messy meetings, meetings where you're really trying to get over the domain and understand kind of the surface area of a situation reason across that surface area by taking clues that each person has, you know, from their own experience and then solving the problem together. Uh, you can even just have it to be a relationship building opportunity. I, in my own team, for instance, you know, we've been focused on kind of some on-site off-sites and we've seen that as a trend across the industry where people are, are coming together now to kind of really coalesce around a particular initiative and to get that initiative started to talk about what they're trying to accomplish, about what the contours of the problem are. And then they go away, they disperse, they can solve that, but they come back together, you know, again, uh, really thoughtfully at the right times to be able to have that just super high bandwidth type of communication. I think what we forget is digital technologies are fantastic, but they do flatten the communication. They do reduce, if you will, 
you know, almost the bit rate that you're transmitting signals to each other. There's just nothing like being in person. We hope we can get there. You know, we may talk later about holograms and things that can help us get there. Uh, but right now, there's nothing like being in person. I definitely want to talk later about holograms. Um, awesome. uh, but so I, I do want to talk about technology in a second. And, you know, I think, you know, Microsoft is obviously experimenting with a lot of technologies that will address really a lot of what you're talking about here. But before we get to that, the, you know, we do work effectively remotely. We do work effectively in, in hybrid situations, but we do complain that we're burning ourselves out, that there's something about work from home that means sort of always, always plugged in, always working. You know, any thoughts on how to handle that? And did that maybe come out in the data that you were looking at? It absolutely did. And let me frame it. You know, when we talk about hybrid work, we focus on one word, it's flexibility, flexibility in how, when, and where you work. That's kind of how we define it. We think that the simplicity of definition really helps us. Unfortunately, what flexibility means is my flexibility is different from yours and different from our colleagues. When you, when you try and overlap all that flexibility, you get people working at all hours of the day in all sorts of different ways, and it could become very overwhelming. In fact, we found that there are four things that just continue to rise for us. Those are what we call the workday span. So the time from when you start work to when you end, that's increased worldwide on average by 46 minutes. That's a big deal, and it continues to climb. After hours and weekend work continues to climb. Uh, time spent in meetings has increased significantly over 252%, but it's kind of leveled off. You only have so many hours in the day to meet with each other. So that's the one thing that's leveled. And then asynchronous work through chat that continues to climb. And what that adds up into is kind of, you know, essentially this, this overwhelming wave of work coming at us all the time uh, in a way that just isn't sustainable. That really came out in the data. The good news is we also saw another pattern in the data. As we started to track how people were using their time, we were able to do this with just aggregated calendar compare. So all across the world, looking at how people are using their time, we found some interesting trends. We found that people were starting their meetings later on Mondays, that they were ending their meetings earlier on Fridays. We love that, giving them some flexibility. We found, as an example, that they had moved many of their scheduled Teams meetings, that's our video conferencing and collaboration tool, uh, to be unscheduled. In fact, 60% of those meetings now were less than 15 minutes and were unscheduled. So we got the sense they were starting to pick up on, hey, you and I don't have to schedule 30 minutes for any, you know, for everything that we're trying to do. Instead, we can transactionally kind of ping each other and, and use the technology more effectively. So, you know, the overwhelming kind of wave of work coming our way, but also at the same time, some encouraging patterns. So I want to talk about technology. I want to get to some questions from, uh, there are a lot of questions coming in from, from our audience. Again, if you have questions for Jared, put them into the, uh, into the discussion. Um, but for a second, I want to, I want to do a little detour. And I'd, I'd love to hear, um, you know, companies around the world are, are trying to figure out you know, what to do, how to respond to what's happening in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, I, I read a little bit about what Microsoft is up to. But can you talk a little bit about how you think about what, what is the appropriate response um, to Ukraine from where you are in, uh, at Microsoft? Well, yeah, like everyone in the world, you know, we are watching very closely, following very closely the, the tragic and unlawful invasion of Ukraine. I mean, I think it has the world transfixed at this point. Um, there are four ways that we have outlined that we're trying to help. And I'm sure this will continue to be fluid. Brad Smith, who's our president, uh, published a blog on this, and I can just quickly hit on them. The first is we've been trying to help protect the Ukraine from cyber attacks. The second is we've been trying to protect the world from state-sponsored disinformation campaigns. This is both a kinetic and a digital war. Uh, the third is we've been involved in humanitarian assistance. We'll continue to be involved that way. And the fourth, of course, is we care deeply about the protection and safety of our own employees. So those four things have, have been what we've outlined to the world as really our areas of focus as we try to do our part. Yeah, okay, well, that's really useful. Thanks, Thanks for that. Um, I, I wanna go to, uh, go to an audience question now. And this is from Carol from the Netherlands, who says uh, uh, he or she has been sharing Microsoft's study on the impact of taking breaks between meetings. What other strategies have you found to be helpful to prevent burnout? Yeah, well, let me start with that study. It's one of my favorites. You know, the, if, I, if I just shortcut the study for a second, what we found is that even a five minute break between video conference meetings makes a huge difference. It's almost like a palate cleanser for the brain. Uh, you know, so personally, as an example, I have a piano that's, you know, 20, 30 feet from here. I'll kind of run out and play the piano. I've been trying to learn how to play over the course of the pandemic. 
And it's been a great way to kind of reset. So that's, you know, those five minute breaks are probably one of the most impactful things that we have seen uh, from our studies. But then I'll cut over to this idea of unscheduled meetings. We really have encouraged people to do less of the, hey, we need to talk, let's block 30 minutes because not every conversation needs to be 30 minutes and instead use the technology, particularly beginning with chat and then escalating up if you need it. And probably the third one that really comes to mind is what I call time blocking. We have found tremendous success as we have been studying this idea of within a work week, uh, bounding, kind of creating these blocks of time so that you can do focused work. One of the biggest issues we, we find with remote and hybrid work is it's easy to interrupt people or to be interrupted. So you can block off your time and concentrate. It, it matters a ton. You know, all the brain studies tell you that you, it takes a while to get into a piece of work. You do your best work after you're ramped up. And boy, things coming at you all the time, they can really throw you off your game. So those are three things um, and we've got more coming. So it's a great question. So, you know, a lot of us um, have Microsoft, you know, it's kind of part of our, our work day. And, and I know you guys have developed um, a lot of new technologies, new software to, to you know, in, enhance how we work, how we interact, to analyze our emails, to look at how we're spending time. Um, I, I'd be interested in, you know, some, some, of, some of these debuted during the pandemic as well. You know, what, what's worked and what has not panned out in, in terms of sort of developing this new, you know, probably machine learning assisted uh, software that you've rolled out? Well, yeah, like everybody else, we're trying to feel our way through this and try and understand what's happening. Um, you know, I'll, I'll cite some things that are that are simple that really we believe are starting to work. One of them that we're rolling out right now is what we call Outlook RSVP. It is so simple because all it, all it does is it allows you to tell the meeting organizer if you're going to attend in person or you're going to attend online. Uh, it's simple, but it really kind of leans toward the future of like, oh, yeah, you know what, for every meeting somebody's likely to be online. Uh, and it's a great example of, of something that works really well for us. Early on, we developed a piece of technology that we called Together Mode. That was really interesting. It allowed us to cut you out of your background and put you on a shared background. Uh, for those who have been tracking the MBA, pick that up then and use that for virtual fans experiences, you know, during their in the bubble season. We were really proud of that. We still think there's a lot of application of Together Mode, but that's going to be morphing, I think, into something that we're calling Front Row now, which is all about how you present digital attendees in more of a physical setting. So I think we'll see less of Together Mode just in a purely digital sense and more of that in the shared kind of some people physical, some people digital um, we're also doing some really interesting things about kind of putting you, you know, within the content that you're presenting. We have this really cool feature called Cameo. It kind of allows you to be almost like a, a weatherman or weather woman who stands up in the midst of their weather map and kind of points things out. We think it's, it's going to be the future of kind of walking through digital content, whether you are physically present or not. Um, and so it's, it's even small things like that that can make a difference. Really, what you'll see is the theme is the fuse going forward, the, the fusing of the digital and the physical. I think that's going to be a huge theme in the technology here over the coming years. Well, one of the things, one of the tools that we probably would like is, is you know, I think particularly when uh, in a hybrid situation or a remote situation, you can't, you can't tell if your colleagues are okay. And you ask them, are you okay? And you're like, yeah, I'm okay. Um, are you developing tools that can tell us if our team members are okay? Um, you know, here's what I'd say. I, the, the idea of being okay, it, well-being and mental health, by the way, was cited as uh, one of the most important things that people value going back to that equation. So you, you've really put your finger on something that's very important. However, it's also a source of, I think, a lot of discussion because of the privacy implications of being okay, if you will, and projecting how okay you are. So a lot of what we're doing right now is working with customers. We actually work with government entities. Uh, we're working with research to try and understand, you know, what do people want to share about themselves and what do they want to keep private? Some of the work that we have done with our products that allow you to help with your own well-being, for instance, customers, individual users will tell us, I don't want that information shared. You know, you can tell me that I'm overbooked. You can give me signals that I'm stressed out. Please do not project those out to my boss or the company, or my colleagues, unless I choose to do that. So I think you're really touching on a subject that's really important. People do want to work on their well-being, but they aren't very excited about projecting that out, you know, and I don't, I don't blame them. I kind of am in that camp where we all go through ups and downs. Yeah. And, and look, a lot of your technology is, you know, it's analyzing email and, and, you know, it's, it's, there's a whole level of 
is that helpful? Is that creepy? How do you how do you find the balance where it just seems helpful? And um, so you you mentioned a couple of things about kind of physical virtual interaction, and that leads inevitably to the metaverse. Um, you know, when your boss Satya Nadella or you know Mark Zuckerberg talk about the metaverse, people get excited because we're wondering if that's the next big thing. But I'd love to hear. I mean, you know, you're 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 inside and you're thinking about all this stuff. Um, you know, to what extent do you think metaverse will be a significant part of our, our business and social lives in the not so distant future? Well, again, I think framing helps or at least helps for me. So you often hear me stand back and say, OK, what are the issues here? For us, a metaverse is a shared digital space that brings together people and really places because it's creating the shared space and things so that people can accomplish certain tasks. Sometimes that's an entertainment oriented task, you know, in my domain it would be a much more commercially relevant task where they're trying to get some business done. If you use that broad definition for a moment, we started our journey towards the metaverse in March of 2020. And the reason I say that is all of a sudden, so much of what we did moved from basically being physically mediated to being digitally mediated. These video conferences we've been in, you know, this experience you and I are having right now that, that sometimes would have previously happened with us in the same studio, we're, they're happening in digital spaces now. So for me, if I frame it up that way, the metaverse is nothing more or less than the continuation of the development of digital spaces. As I look at where we're headed, you know, we kind of see three important mileposts coming up. The first would be the adding of avatars into these digital spaces. Today, most of what we've done is camera on, you and I are talking, people get to see us, but adding this idea of an avatar, essentially kind of a a character that's digitally represented to represent us, that's an important step. We'll be doing some of that work in this first half of, of 2022, adding that to teams. And we've got some interesting research I can share on how people feel about avatars. Then the next stop for us would be what we call augmented reality. This is the ability to project digital things. They can sometimes be people or things into physical space. That already with HoloLens is, is being done all across the world in all sorts of industries. And then the third one we get into is fully immersive virtual reality. And you're just starting to see some of that in the industry. And that will take a little bit longer, though the experience is uh, pretty impressive right now as you kind of move into a digital space that feels like, wow, I'm here with other people. So moving from where we are today to you know that first, if you will, milestone or milepost of, of uh, avatars, that's not too hard. And you're going to see that in the near future. So that, that all sounds pretty cool. On the other hand, you know, we were talking about sort of social capital and, and you know, the, 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 there's nothing like physical connection to, you know, for certain building that social capital. You know, avatars seem to be uh, somewhere in between that sort of, you know, connection that we're valuing. And uh, so, so, so talk, talk more, you know, so, so for those of us who, who might think avatars seem somewhat alienating from even this kind of, you know, Zoom, Zoom type, Teams type interaction, you know, talk about the, the value of avatars for people who maybe, you know, don't get that. People who are doubtful, maybe. I don't blame you for being People doubtful. are skeptical, yes. That's right. It's a, it's a new thing. Look, we're learning like everybody else, so we're doing a lot of experimentation ourselves. Um, the, the, the place that I'd start is by saying today, if you want to indicate that you're, you're engaged with a conversation, you, you basically have, you know, a binary decision. My camera's on or my camera's off. There are a lot of situations in which having my camera on is not conducive to us talking. When I'm in transit, as an example, uh, a, a norm that's developed over the pandemic is we don't keep our video videos on, video feeds on while we're eating. You know, that's another example. There are a number of, you can be in a very loud or kind of bi visually busy environment if you happen to be in a manufacturing environment, just as simple examples. So in the research, what we found is that people are, are awfully interested in ways of indicating I'm in, I'm listening and I'm participating, even when they can't show kind of what's going on at the time. And so, you know, there is a, an immediate need for avatars. When we've gone into the lab and we've used avatars in meetings, and then we have pulled the people who are non-avatars and asked them, what was that like? And would you consider doing it? After attending a meeting with an avatar, people are more likely to consider using an avatar themselves. So we have been encouraged by that. And then just recently in this work trend index that we talked about earlier, we asked a lot of questions about the metaverse. Um, as a simple example, 52% of the people we, we surveyed said that they were open to using digital immersive spaces within the metaverse for meetings as teams in the future. And then we also saw kind of um, some variation between the demographics of of people. And you would probably expect that 
And that's a simple example. If I went to one side, we see 28% of boomers who thought that metaverse technologies like avatars would be useful and they were open to that. Whereas when we get up to Gen Z, we see 51% of people open to it. So you see kind of the expected changes in terms of you know openness based largely, I think, on their exposure already to these technologies and other domains like gaming. So we're getting some questions and actually a lot of them are coming from our, um, our people who are watching on, on YouTube. So we, uh, we're now broadcasting on, on LinkedIn and YouTube. So it's great to see the questions coming in. Um, you know, really asking about it, you know, how, how do we deal with, with some of the technology fatigue, Zoom fatigue, whatever you call it. But here's a question, and this is from Dustin in Boston. Um, it's interesting. So, so what can companies do to offset the increased workloads the kind of balloon during the pandemic, you know, I mean, that's sort of the burnout question I asked before, you know, how do we, how do we offset that so that employees can, you know, be enabled to build that social capital? Yeah, I'll get really practical for a moment because we've both done research on this and then just within Microsoft and my own team, we've been trying some of these things out and there's some things that have really worked. So, you know, I guess what I would say is going back to this flexibility means everybody can work at different times. Part of the onslaught that we feel is that like, wow, everything is coming at me all at once. So we have found that instituting team norms around communication makes a tremendous difference. For instance, on my team, we've decided that unless it's an emergency, we're not going to email each other after 6 p.m. That makes a huge difference, especially managers. You know, as managers don't do that, they create this expectation that I'm not going to send you something after six. We've done the same thing for weekend work. We've applied liberally uh, what we call, you know, delayed delivery from Outlook. You can process your email, but just delay deliver it so that people don't get it until a work kind of in, in work period, like a Monday morning. That already makes a huge difference. We've also made some changes to kind of how we think about meetings. We have experimented things with like no meeting Friday afternoons. We've done no meeting days as an example. I know some teams um, have done no video conferencing days. You can meet, but you must meet in person. So people are just experimenting with various norms. And I think they're making a difference. You know, again, if I go back to some of those simple ones where you're just signaling, hey, I'm not going to email you after six, you kind of lower everyone's blood pressure and feel like I may choose to work after six, but I'll choose to do the work that I can do without essentially creating pressure for other people. So you started this conversation by talking about the, the expectations gap that, uh, you know, employers are starting to think, yeah, we want people back in the office more, maybe, maybe like the old days and employees not sure they're ready for that. So this is a question, uh, again, from YouTube, from, from Gordon in Canada. You know, so what's your advice? How can leaders close that expectation gap so that there is better alignment on how we're going to work going forward? Well, I think there are just two different mental models. You know, um, there are two data points that really caught my attention as I was combing through the data looking for what's going on here. What do people really think in those camps? 80% of the general employees, so these are people just working, say that their productivity has remained the same or has been even better as they've worked from home. It's a pretty high number. Whereas over 50% of leaders say that they believe productivity has suffered and innovation has suffered. So you have the people thinking, this has been great. And leaders thinking, I'm not so sure about this. And again, getting to very practical hints, uh, what we're finding is it's just important to bridge that gap by having the two talk to each other. What I'm seeing is kind of the biggest misstep out there right now is, is leaders sitting in conference rooms virtually or otherwise, you know, deciding it's time to go back. And off they go and they kind of issue an edict without really talking to employees. We would encourage people to get down, use listening systems. You know, at Microsoft, we literally listen to our employees every day. We do a poll every day of a percentage of the population. We're all constantly trying to understand what's employee sentiment towards some of these really important issues. And we're trying to create that two-way dialogue. I had just the other day, I was asking someone about this and he said, yeah, my leaders don't want to do that though because they're afraid that there's going to be pressure to do things that they don't want to do. And my simple answer for that is, look, have the leaders stand up and say, I may not do everything you want me to do, but I really want to know what's on your minds. And that creates, I think, a bit of a, a, a free space where a leader can listen carefully, deliberate, take input, take counsel, and then say, well, you know, I've heard what you had to say, but I've chosen a different path. I think the listening gets you much further than most leaders would recognize. So for you personally, how, how has your, you know, compare your work day let's say, you know, February 2020 versus now. To what extent is it the same? To what extent has it changed? February 2020, I was in every day. You know, I worked kind of a standard schedule in the office from seven to probably five, six. I think I went home at six. 
Um, I was on that typical commute pattern, you know, with, with everybody else in the Seattle, greater Seattle area moving into their employer, you know, at those two times of the day. Um, now, I, it's not like I don't go into the office. There have been a couple of weeks here over the last few weeks I've been in every day. But the interesting thing is my traffic patterns have varied. The traffic patterns here have varied. I go in at different times. I'm often in for, you know, a few hours or half a day as opposed to a full day. So that's very different. Um, I find myself, uh, I have implemented, you know, what I caught, what we referred to earlier as time blocking is something very important that I do. And I've been even more draconian about kind of when I work, you know, start at seven, I'm finished at six. I really, I have, I have commitments outside. I'm a community church leader and I have commitments outside. So I really am not working after six for Microsoft. I kind of have other things that are important to me. So I feel like I've shifted, you know, much, much like the, the survey results kind of indicate I've. I'm right there along with what we're seeing in that survey. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Thanks for that. Um, so here's another question. This is from James, um, a YouTube commenter. Um, and this, is, this isn't exactly your field, but everything's so, so related these days. So the question is, so the, the commenter mentions that, you know, your neighbors in Seattle, Starbucks and Amazon have been, you know, dealing with organized labor issues that have come up. And so the question is really, you know, would Microsoft support that kind of worker-led agency or, you know, is there a view about organized labor um, in Microsoft now? You know, I'm not the best person to comment on that. On that. I'm sure that our HR folks could give you a position. What, what I can talk about would, would be to say it's really important for us here at Microsoft to build a work environment where we feel like everyone's work is valued and everybody has a voice and we're working together towards common goals. And under our CEO, Satya Nadella, I think that's been one of the biggest changes during his time as the CEO of the company is really trying to move into what he would call a growth mindset and apply that even to the employee experience overall, you know, everything about the employee experience. So over the last two years, I've been continually amazed by what our HR group is doing. And instead of, you know, reacting to what employees are saying, I feel like they've been very proactive, again, using listening systems to engage on topics. And we have taken stands that have been different than some of our competitors, you know, on, on difficult issues. But as we've done that, we really try to engage with a position, a point of view, and then some openness to discuss. We really do try, though, to take counsel as leaders and then to decide and commit um, and to line up once we have a, a good discussion about things. So I, I'm not the best to comment on the first topic, but I can definitely talk about the overall play experience we're trying to create. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I appreciate your, your taking that on. Um, so we're a little over time, but I, I, if you have another minute, you know, I'd love to sort of end with... Um, you know, have some fun here and, and project out, you know, we've been talking about kind of, you know, new technology, metaverse, whatever, that's sort of within our grasp, but, you know, project forward a little bit. I mean, you know, you, you must have sessions where you really think about, all right, what does the world of work look like in, I don't know, 2050 or something like that. And, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, some of, some of the possibilities for what this will be, you know, how we'll, how we'll work together you know, a decade out or two decades out? What are some thoughts? There's a lot going on here, a lot going on. You know, I would say that the focus for us right now as we think about a decade out, two decades out, is about that human connection we started with. You know, at the end of the day, whether it's social capital or anything we're trying to do, the deeper the connection, the higher the kind of exchange of information and connection, we feel like the more people are able to be productive together. That's kind of our underlying assumption. So some of the stuff that gets me really excited is about the use of holograms as a simple example. We kind of pointed to those earlier. When you put a representation of a person who's not physically there into the physical space that you're in, there is an amazing feeling of like, wow, Joe or Sally is right here, but they're not. And I'm getting information because they are they are three-dimensional. I have kind of a, a, a richness to this exchange that we don't otherwise have. And so as we project out what we're trying to do, you know, into that decade out is to think, boy, how can we make it feel like we can transcend time and we can transcend space? You know, what does that look like? And what would the technologies be? Holograms are the easiest ones to visualize because we can already do some of that today in a lab. Uh, some of it also requires, for instance, you know, using something like the HoloLens. And we want to understand what would it take to do that without a HoloLens? Or what would it take to shrink the technology so it just feels like a pair of glasses, nothing more? Uh, that's where things are going. It's all in service, though, I'd say, Adi, of that deep human connection. For us, that is the future. You know, we believe that deep human connections, they make all the difference. They make the difference in world peace, frankly. They make the difference in innovation. They make the difference in us being able to move the, the human family forward. 
That's a great answer. I, I, I just want to follow up though quickly. So, you know, a couple of those things you mentioned, you know, the hologram approach, uh, you know, the kind of VR glasses that are, that are, you know, not big goggles, but are, are more, you know, organic part of your clothing, whatever, you know, are, are those close or are those, are those years and years away? Well, I wouldn't say they're years and years away. We're trying to get the technology smaller and smaller when it comes to, you know, things that you're actually wearing. There are also ways to do that without ever putting anything on your body. And that's another angle or dimension that we're looking, you know, what can we do to create some of these experiences so that you can just experience them and what's the tech required around you to make that possible. As you, as you simply look at these spaces that are being outfitted for connection, you know, a conference room as an example, people are willing to pay for the hardware. And so we're really trying to look at, hey, for commodity hardware prices, can we start to create, you know, some of those experiences that feel magical? So both both directions, I wouldn't say that they're years and years out, um, but, you know, they're not ready for production here this summer yet. Got it. Um, Jared, I want to thank you for for being on The New World of Work. Really fascinating to, to you know, see what you're up to, the research you're doing, the, the thinking you're doing about the future. Thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you, Adi. All right, so fantastic. That was Jared Spataro, who again is, you know, really heading a lot of Microsoft's very interesting work in thinking about, you know, the future of work and the technology that will take us there. So um, our guest next week, so that's Wednesday, March 23rd at uh, 12 noon Eastern time, will be Gregory Hayes, who is the CEO and chair of Raytheon Technologies. We'll talk about uh, the war in Ukraine and how that has affected the company's business. And we'll talk about how the pandemic has changed how Raytheon uh, operates in terms of R&D, in terms of its own approach to, to hybrid and remote work. So, so we will see you next week. Thank you for joining us.